Kicking off the list at number 10, the Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now, for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course, one of the bloodiest battles in history. How it all began, though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way, she's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't. I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit and the guy sadly fell in. Now normally you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. Poor guy suffocated in his own, what a horrible way to go out. One of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, Malin Matt's daughter. Okay, sometimes in history, humans can be found guilty of practicing witchcraft. This is wild. This was like, imagine, imagine that today. I've mentioned Giles Corey on this list before. He's a brave soul, but we also have to mention Malin Matt's daughter. She doesn't get the light as much as Giles does. It's one thing for a town to turn against you and call you a witch, but imagine family. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow and her own daughter told everybody that she was a witch. She was the last victim of the great Swedish witch hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully the last, one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Yeah, she didn't cry out in pain. She didn't beg for forgiveness. She said all this witchy nonsense was hogwash and she stood by it too. What an OG, she was a champ, she was a badass. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury. So later she met a similar fate. You know what I'm saying? What goes around, comes around. Like a witch flying on a broom in circles. Number six, wedding season. Okay, we'll brighten the mood up a little bit. We'll start going this way in ancient history. Maybe you fantasized about your own big day, right? Maybe it's a beach wedding. Maybe it's a themed wedding, like a winter wonderland. Maybe it's a nice ice palace. It's always fun, I guess. I'm Canadian, so I'm like, no, definitely, but I hear you. It's your big day, okay? Get creative. They say the best month to get married is June. And again, from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must. See, June was the month of the god June. No. And they protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth. So if it's between that and Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, right? Better omens over here, for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then. So when majority of the population washed up at the end of May or the beginning of June, everybody smelt nice, right? Everyone felt good and they wanted to celebrate. So why not have weddings in this month as well, right after we have a little bubble bath or two. That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. It does make sense. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Yeah, maternity leave, 
Never heard of it, sorry. Welcome to ancient history. It's the worst. Number five, best man origins. I got asked to be a best man recently, so you know what? I have to share some, some, some love. I have to share some ancient best man love. It was a little different back then, that's for sure. Back in those days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom. That's normal, whether that's a brother or a best friend. Back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different, and it was all about protecting one's assets rather than, you know, anything to do with love. Back then, bride kidnapping was so common that if there was somebody else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to send someone else, they might try and steal her for themselves, right? It's awful. That's where the best man comes in. He's got to watch for dudes hopping fences ready to steal your wife and run away. The best man's job was to protect the bride at all costs. And if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. That's wild. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure she didn't try and make a run for it as well. It sounds okay at first and then you're like, oh no, it's all horrible. History, of course. Number four, ancient divorce. Eh, it happens sometimes. Weird, almost like those marriages I just uh, explained, wouldn't work out all the time. Weird. Trial by combat, you've probably heard of this, right? We've all seen that Game of Thrones episode. With the eyes and the, huh. Yeah, that's a good one. That was the norm, right? You fight for your freedom. But what about divorce by combat? You ever heard of this? If you and your significant other weren't getting along back in the dark ages, instead of dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork, instead, you would battle each other in front of a crowd because why not? It's the medieval times. It was an organized event that included restrictions for the husband. Now, it's pretty hilarious to think back on, but the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back, while the wife, soon to be happy ex-wife, ran around in circles around said hole, also carrying a sack full of rocks, hitting the ex-husband with the rocks the whole time. Yeah, Pretty intense and also pretty hilarious to think of. Yeah, that's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot. Get out of here. A sack of rocks? Just take the castle, take the horse. I don't care, I'm out. I'll sign anything. I'll stamp anything. Number three, the battle of the stray dog. Okay, now we're gonna go back into some weird battles that we probably missed in school. I grew up with dogs my whole life, okay? It's stressful at times. You open the door for a second and all of a sudden your furry friends are running down the street after a blue jay and your heart's racing. Since the second Balkan war in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head, right? At this point, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions were of course high. But come October 1925, things finally escalated even more. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog, who just decided to bolt randomly. But in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria. So he was shot at, right? It was scary. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria and soon began a full-on war. All because of this dog who saw a blue jay probably. By the time the international committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up the obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So yeah, keep those leashes on, please, unless you're in a off-leash dog park. Cause you might start a war, you never know. Number two, the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course I have to mention this battle. This one's a little bit different, but you know, maybe some UFO stuff going on here. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February, 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So yeah, everybody was of course immensely stressed out at this point. And then something like 25 enemy aircraft was then spotted flying over LA in the late hours of February 24th. So now, everyone's freaking out. Air raids went off, blackouts were in effect. This was not a drill, right? Right? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells. In total, around 1,400 shells were all fired off. Two people had heart attacks. Five people died in total from this retaliation. And it was all a false alarm. Yep. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah. Huh, oops. Thought I heard a noise, my bad, we'll just close that. No one touches anymore, I guess. War nerves. And finally, number one, Battle of Zappolino. This one is pretty epic, okay. All over a bucket. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino, it was a large scale event all over a tiny bucket. And no, I'm not joking. The War of the Oaken Bucket. Now this war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina. Now it all kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal. To steal the wooden bucket from the city's well. Right? Resources were sparse back then, of course, so the Bolognese declared war, and then they sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Modena had a smaller army. They had 500 infantrymen and only 2,000 cavalry forces. But the thing is, 
Those guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Now some recall them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city, but right now the bucket is currently on display still in Modena. So it ended up finding its forever home there. And you can go check it out if you want. Kick it off the list at number 10, Black Cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you. What's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff. Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory the Ninth, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now at first when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine, Flat Earth. Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat, that's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere, with four cardinal points as well, even going back Further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to, I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman law laundry days, urine makes leather soft, we get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help, they were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chad. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh Number six, 
The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renters agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs, who were laborers, who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain a good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generali were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully, maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the middle ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the fifth century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, Dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh, but it's, I can't, 
I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trafea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more, all moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths. That's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up. It's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it! Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way, we're all dancing. Number 10! We will get out of lockdown! I don't know. Maybe? We'll see. I think so. I'm starting this one as number 10 because I literally cannot believe we are here. I just got my second dose and it was officially two weeks last Friday, so hugs are a coming. And I remember feeling even a few months ago that this would never happen. Researchers estimate that over 9.5 billion doses of the vaccine will be administered by the end of 2022. That means that for weddings, school, restaurants, libraries, work without masks is going to be in our future. With the Delta variant still at play, there is the possibility of other precautions being put in place, but still, if not by 2022, then eventually. <laughs> the vaccines can protect against it, so as long as we keep doing our part to keep each other safe, we are on the way, babies. I'm gonna hug so many people. Maybe even you, or you, or you, Chris. Number nine, the Sagrada Familia. One of the largest and longest construction projects will finally come to an end. Antonio Gaudi's masterpiece began construction in 1882 and has had nine, nine architects take over since. It is called the Sagrada Familia Church and is located in Barcelona, Spain, or Barcelona, as they say in Vicky Christine Barcelona. I love that. Barcelona? Jordi Folly and his team will be the last people to ever work on it. The pure extravagance and luxury of this building is overwhelmingly breathtaking, but why on earth has it taken so long? Well, the original architect died in 1926, there was the Spanish Civil War, the original project was destroyed and lack of funding. The majority of the project was privately funded and subsidized. The designs that Gaudi laid down are also incredibly complex with each layer and brick containing intricate details. He wanted to build the highest church in the world and that it will be with the central Jesus Tower reaching 172.5 meters. But finally after 150 years of construction the church will finally be complete in 2026. If everything goes well. You never know. As we found out in the last two years. You just never know. Number eight, the triple Jovian eclipse. Some really cool things have already happened these past few months and there's plenty more to come so don't you worry. The next Jovian eclipse is set to happen in 2032. What is that you ask? Well, three of Jupiter's largest moons, Io, Ganymede, and Callisto will align across the planet's surface like a couple of cool space polka dots. Yeah, we'll call them that. Jupiter has 16 moons in total, and the three mentioned are among the biggest in its orbit. The last time this happened was in 2004 and was caught on the Hubble Space Telescope by some miracle. The event happens so quickly, and this time scientists are hoping to capture the event in sharp detail. So stay tuned. Watch your Google. Number seven, Lost at Sea. The Robertson family, they're quite a historical one. Strap in, folks. Back in 1971, Dougal, Lynn, and their four children, and Douglas, Neil, and Sandy, all set sail on what was planned to be a trip around the world. It sounds magnificent. Our family saw a movie once. Aboard their 13 meter boat, the Lucette, they traveled through the Caribbean and then across the Panama Canal to the Pacific, right? That was their trail. A year and a half went by, they were on route through the Galapagos and one of the daughters, Anne, who was 18, decided to leave the voyage. Yeah, she's like, ah, you know what? I'm actually not on board for this anymore. I'm really seasick, bye. And then in Panama, they took on a hitchhiker named Robin Williams. Great name. This hitchhiker was in for more of an adventure than they thought, because after this point, their lives were never the same again. West of the Galapagos Islands, a pod of killer whales struck the boat. Wood then began to crack, and the boat subsequently started to sink. They all moved to the inflatable life raft, but after 16 days of using their own breath to keep inflating it over and over 24-7, the six of them were sadly forced to relocate into an even smaller dinghy. Then they somehow survived for 38 days at sea, while sailing towards the center of the Pacific. 
Pacific with no goal in mind other than to survive. All they had to drink was some water left over from the Lucette, with sea turtles being their only diet. Yeah, save the turtles, unless of course you're stranded at sea, then in that case, sorry to 52 of you. Finally, after 38 days, they were spotted by a passing Japanese fishing boat, and then thankfully, they were rescued. Number six, Mad Jack Churchill. No, not that Churchill, but equally as British, and even bolder. Mad Jack Churchill, AKA John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill, was a British army officer who fought in the Second World War with a longbow, bagpipes, and a Scottish broadsword. Dude, this guy lived a life. Was in like every war trained people how to fight and how to parachute. This guy was fighting machine guns with a bow and a sword and was at like the front of the lines, leading them, taunting people, playing the bagpipes. You know how intimidating that is? How is there not like 15 movies about this guy? Not only did he thrive in the rough stuff, guy revolutionized surfing. He was also pissed the Americans dropped some nukes. He wanted to keep fighting, you know? Like imagine that pep talk. What eight lads? I'm gonna play a wee jingle here first, and then I'm gonna go out, take this sword, and I'm gonna start swinging. All right? Good luck. Number five, fake France. Towards the end of World War I, Paris was tired of, you know, seeing their city of love get blown to smithereens, as one would. So they figured, you know what? Let's try and fool those Germans, right? Let's try and do some trickery. Let's just build a fake Paris and then shut out all the lights. And it worked. Yeah, they psyched them out. They created a decoy, a very large decoy. The life-size stunt double was posted up only a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. This tiny town called Mason's Lafayette, now of course it's looking a lot more full than it was when it was, you know, a hollow shell of a fake town, now it's a tourist area. There were once three different zones set up around the real Paris. Zone A was northeast of the city, had fake train stations, mimicked a suburban region of St. Denis, but it had a big fake Gare du Nord train station, right? That was the main pull. Like, hey, come on, we're looking nice and Hopeful, come attack us, and it worked. Zone B, northwest of the city, that was Mason's Lafayette, the main fake Paris, right? And zone C was the industrial area, just east of the city. They had massive factories built with, you know, obviously nothing inside of them. This sounds pretty home alone when you think of it, but these missions only happening overnight, creating a light show with some big fancy props isn't a bad idea. It's gonna save a lot of lives and money. Lights were carefully spaced out so it looked like a breathing city from above, and they fell for it for some of the time. They looney tuned the Germans, and it worked. They're like, yeah, it's Paris. Hit that really fast, it's good. Number four, space junk. In 1961, John Glenn would become the first astronaut to successfully orbit in space. He lapped the Earth a couple times with the help of Friendship 7, NASA's command mission pushing ever closer and closer to the moon. While in space, Glenn and fellow crew noticed tiny gold particles that shone like fireflies. Quote, uh, this is Friendship 7, uh, try to describe what I'm seeing up here. Uh, it's a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up like uh, they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it, they're around a little, they're coming out of the capsule and they just look like stars, a whole shower of them coming over, over. They had come to the conclusion, it was liquid from inside the capsule and the suits leaking out. And that liquid was urine. Not aliens, not fireflies, not disintegrating ship, frozen pee pee. Yeah, guess drinking all that tang all day. Glenn flew on Discovery in 1998 and became at age 77 the oldest person to fly in space at the time. Damn Shatner. Number three, Project MDXX. If you've seen Project X, this one's gonna ring a bell or two. About 500 years ago, yep, you missed it, in 1520, for two and a half weeks in June, both England's King Henry VIII and Francis Francis I, two of the greatest monarchs in Renaissance Europe, they both threw a joint birthday party that lasted 18 days, and it only cost about $19 million by today's standards. Nice. I went mini putting for my eighth birthday. That's why I called it Project MDXX. The numerals in the year, yeah, you get it, not bad. Not only was this a chance for them to celebrate their friendship, but it was also a chance for them to try and outdo one another and continue to show off. So for this huge bash, for starters, around 12,000 people showed up and gathered in the fields of the northern tip of what is now France. All tents, costumes, decorations were all gold embellished. Guests were fed 29,000 fish, 98,000 eggs, 6,400 birds, 2,200 sheep, and 216,000 gallons of wine just to wash all that clout down. Mm. On top of that, there were jousts, wrestling matches, elaborate mask parties. I have FOMO just talking about it right now. The two kings both wanted to outdo each other, but there were rules put in place beforehand. 
These kings could not compete with one another during the celebrations, right? So instead, they tried to outspend each other in a nice way. They're like, oh yes, look at all of my gold. No, look at all my gold. We love blowing all of our resources in two and a half weeks. Nice. Looking good, guys. Keep it up. Number two, Olympic arts. In the early 20th century, the Olympics were getting creative, literally. Hundreds of years of blood, sport, and victorious games, and people were looking for some new events. 1912 Summer Olympics, they decided to add official awarded medals for painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, and music. All right. One rule though, they had to be of Olympic sport nature. Paintings of people boxing, sculptures of people whipping discs around, and of course, a couple doodles of some dudes playing rugby. Which won Gene Jacoby two gold medals. Of course, these were Olympic grade pieces of art. So you know they were the best of the best. Of course, you could compete in both sport and art. American athlete Walter Winnens took the podium after winning gold in sharpshooting, and also the very first gold in sculpture. Yeah, lovely. He made a little bronze horse pulling a chariot. Isn't that nice? People just taping up their wrists, mouth guards in, and you're just sharpening your pencil. Hey, how are you? About to draw. <laughs> Good luck. And finally, number one. Jurassic Timeline. All right, this one goes out to all the T-Rexes out there. If you're watching, hit that thumbs up with your little hands. Nice big reach, hit that subscribe button. When we think of the times of the dinosaurs, we tend to think of all them roaming the planet at one time, and then a meteor hit, and then they were all toast. But that is certainly not the case. It's a little shocking, but here's our timeline. Dinosaur communities were not only spread apart by geography, but also by time and the age of the dinosaurs. For one, it lasted so long that it included three separate geological time periods. It's a long time. Fun fact, there is more time separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from the Stegosaurus than there is separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from humans. Yeah, that's how long ago dinosaurs have been kicking, or not kicking rather, you know what I mean? We can't comprehend this time. Like this is so far away, it doesn't even make sense. We think of the ancient Egyptians, and we're like, oh, that's, I don't know. Dinosaurs? Stegosaurus, you know those herbivores with the plates on their back and the spiky tails, they always do this and take out your cars, whatever, Jurassic World, I've seen it. They roamed Earth 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period and the age of the dinosaurs. Then the T-Rex first appeared about 80 million years after the Stegosaurus had been extinct. And that was about, you know, 67 million years ago from today. This means that while 80 million years separated those two, there's only 67 million years that separate us from a T-Rex. Crazy fact. Uh, hit that thumbs up. Starting off with some geography, we got Lake Nyos. How can a lake kill 1,700 people? Well, though it sounds too insane to be true, it did indeed happen. Located in West Africa, the lake itself is deceptively beautiful. However, on August 21st, 1986, a mysterious cloud burst from the lake. It flooded towards the village and suffocated 1,700 people and animals. Nothing survived the event. The reason this happened is because beneath the water there is a pocket of magma that leaks carbon dioxide into the lake. The CO2 stays dissolved in the water due to the pressure of the 650 feet of water on top of the magma secretions. Crazy, so kind of like a pop bottle with an invisible lid. Until one day, that lid popped. On that day, the lake abruptly depressurized and the CO2 exploded into the air, causing the devastating event. Today, pipes are used to siphon the CO2 out from the bottom of the lake in order to prevent this from happening again. But imagine when it did happen, it must have felt like some kind of magical grim occurrence. For, for sure. Number nine, the Salem Witch Trials. If you follow me on MA, you just know how much I hate the Salem Witch Trials. I hate them so much, okay? It's an event in history that is so inconceivably stupid, it's hard to believe it actually happened. The Salem Witch Trials occurred in Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693, where more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft and 20 were put to death. It all started because the daughter of Reverend Paris, Elizabeth, who was nine, and his niece, Abigail Williams, same age, started having fits. Another girl, Anne Putnam, age 11, started having them as well. The supernatural was blamed and soon the girls began accusing everyone they could, mostly people the town didn't like. Basically, if you confessed and you wanted to be saved, then you weren't executed, but if you were accused and didn't confess, you were killed. The paranoia was so bad that once you were accused, you couldn't escape this guilt they put on you. It was insane. 
But after the paranoia finally subsided, the colony admitted that they probably made a mistake and compensated the families. Like yeah, oops, might have gotten a little carried away there. Wow, whew, I got excited, sorry guys. Here's some money. The Salem Witch Trials today represent what happens when paranoia rules a courtroom and the whole thing still beguiles the world even 300 years later. Number 8. Unsinkable Sam On a happier note, this is the kind of story that makes people believe that cats have 9 lives. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tale begins aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Among the 2200 soldiers was a black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. One day, the Bismarck was decimated during an attack, and while the HMS Cossack was looking for survivors, they saw Oscar the Cat, name of the time, seeking refuge on a plank, like Jack from the Titanic. They hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Cossack would be decimated. That's shipwreck number two. This time, it was the HMS Arc Royale who spotted him and was then dubbed the name Unsinkable Sam. And then, shipwreck number three. Months later, as you can guess, the Royale was torpedoed. And once again, Sam was saved by the HMS Legion of the British Royal Fleet. Finally, this seafaring feline retired to land and later died in 1955. At number seven, Valentinian the First. You know when you see someone get really mad and a lot of the time there's that one vein in their head that just pops out while their face turns red? Well, that thing unalived someone once. That's right, a person once got so unbelievably angry that they died. Roman Emperor Valentinian I was known to be a pretty hot-headed guy and during his monarchy he had rivals in Danube called the Quadi tribe. Valentinian was very invested in this rivalry and they were in constant conflict with one another. In November of 375 CE, Valentinian received a note from the Quadi tribe demanding that they be left alone in peace as they supply new troops to the army of Rome. On top of that, some Quadi troops also claim that this whole feud between them and the emperor was because of the Roman forts that were built on their land. They even claimed that because of this, they weren't obligated to follow any of the terms of the Roman treaty and that they could attack whenever they wanted. As you could imagine, hearing all the stuff from his rivals really ticked off the emperor. He got so mad that he started yelling at Quadi agents and his yelling was so intense that a blood vessel in his brain ended up bursting and he passed away shortly afterwards. Number six, the Great Emu War. I thought this event was a joke for like a very long time, but like many on this list, it actually happened. It all started in 1932 when a large emu population began devastating farms. Many of the farmers were ex-soldiers and after the devastation persisted, petitioned for military aid to defeat the pests. Keep in mind that emus can grow as tall as like 6.5 feet and have really sharp claws. They're, they're fierce. We didn't know how fierce until the Minister of Defense, George Pierce, deployed troops and expected to eradicate the pests, I don't know, very quickly. But oh, oh, oh they were in for a surprise. They vastly underestimated these killer cunning birds as they soon proved impossible to hit with machine gun fire. They just like barreled forward like Superman getting hit by bullets. Like they were like it didn't even matter. They would get hit and then just keep running. They were so fast that even their vehicles couldn't keep up with them. <laughs> it's so funny. Within a week, the military gave up and they killed only like 50 to 200 emus out of like 20,000 of them. George Pierce earned the title of Minister of the Emu War. What a way to go. Eventually they did try again later that November, which resulted in 284,700 deaths of emus between 1945 to 1960. But dang, that is some pest control. But we all know that girl on TikTok who has like emus and she like puts her hand out when they try and hiss at her. They needed her. She would have just like dummied the whole population and they would have followed her like the messiah. At number five, atomic tourism. If you could do anything or go anywhere while on vacation, what would you do? Maybe go on a cruise or visit a tropical destination? But how about go and watch bombs get tested? Well, if you were around in the 1950s, then atomic tourism might have been one of your options for entertainment while on vacation. In the 50s, the US was expanding its arsenal of nuclear weapons due to the threat of the Soviet Union and their nuclear firepower. Because this was such a big 
thing, the Tourist Bureau of Las Vegas decided to profit off the US military's weapons testing and make an entire attraction out of it. Because testing for these nuclear weapons took place in the desert in Nevada, a tourist site was set up a safe distance away so that people could watch these weapons be detonated as well as have a beautiful view of the Nevada horizon. People would bring picnics to watch the nuclear weapons and at night time they would throw parties while they waited for the next explosion. It's such a weird tourist attraction but then again the 1950s were also a weird time anyway. Number 4 Agent 355. So they are actually making a movie inspired by this one because of course it would make a great movie. Move over 007, there is a new agent in town and I smell an excellent film legacy brewing. After a hasty retreat made by George Washington leaving more control in British hands, he needed to come up with a stealthier way to retaliate. Thus, the Culper spy ring was born. This intelligence operation was so good at keeping secrets, some of the identities of the spies were never revealed, especially the identity of Agent 355. Not even Washington himself knew who was working for him or who was 355, but we do know that they were a female agent, a spy of expert skill. It was because of her that the head of England's intelligence, Major John Andre, was arrested. Notoriously handsome and debonair, 355 could have been any of the women that fawned over him at parties, gathering his secrets. One secret in particular was his plan to sell West Point to the British. After documents pertaining to his ordeal was uncovered, he was arrested and condemned. But as to who would be directly thanked for this capture was unknown. The only other suspected fact about her was that a female spy was reportedly killed on a prison ship in 1780. Of course there are theories regarding her real identity, but Agent 355 was so good at her job that who she was and what else she did would be taken to her grave. At number 3, Chrysippus. You know how when you laugh really hard and you start gasping for air and your stomach starts to hurt from tensing up your body so much? Well this once killed someone. A Greek philosopher named Chrysippus actually died from laughter. In the 3rd century BCE, the philosopher laughed so hard because he saw his donkey eating figs and then he kicked the bucket so to speak. According to science, death by laughter can occur because of asphyxiation, because you just can't breathe because you're laughing so hard, or through an aneurysm because of the tension from laughing. What's so wild about this is the fact that this wasn't the first time in history that death by laughter has happened. It is said that Cleopatra's father died the same way because he was laughing at the death of her husband and a 5th century Greek painter met the same fate because he laughed too hard at one of his own paintings. And a Danish audiologist passed away in a similar fashion in 1989 because he saw a funny scene in a movie that raised his heart rate so much that he died. Number 2 The First Marathon The Battle of Marathon is one of the most famous Greek battles in history and it's also epic and I also can't believe it happened because it's so cool. Back in 490 BC, the Greeks faced off against the invading Persians on the plains of Marathon. It was a victory that would go down in history as a testament to courage and excellence. But it wasn't only the battle itself, but a man named Phidippes whose actions were so insane, some people think it was a myth. He was sent to enlist the help of Spartans before the battle, so he ran to Sparta but stopped in Athens. First. The total distance was 240 kilometers, like there and back. I can barely make four kilometers. Imagine 240 kilometers on foot. He wasn't just like a basic guy though, he was what was called a hemerodromos, a sacred day long runner in the military. They were known for covering incredible distances by foot, even for going sleep. They would most likely have consumed figs and cured meat, like that's it. His journey inspired the marathon's run today, and even some have tried to make the exact trek he did. Meanwhile, it's a struggle for me to even do like a half hour workout at the end of the day. <laughs> And finally, at number one, Robert Liston. Robert Liston was probably the worst doctor in the history of medicine because he messed up so bad it is unbelievable. This surgeon in the 1800s performed a surgery that had a 300% mortality rate. So he went in to help someone and ended up killing three people as a result. Liston was performing a simple leg amputation but was working so fast that he ended up cutting off two of his assistant's fingers during the procedure. Both the assistant and the patient ended up passing away after contracting gangrene. Now you're probably asking yourself, well what about the third person? You said this had a 300% mortality rate. Well let me tell you how the third person perished. During the procedure, Liston swiped near an elderly doctor with one of his blades. Thinking that he had been cut, the doctor started freaking out and went into shock. The stress was so much that the doctor ended up having a heart attack and passed away. So in the end, Robert Liston killed three people trying to save one life and failed miserably. Number 10. 
John Mack. In the early 90s, a Pulitzer Prize winning psychologist named Dr. John E. Mack made the jump from diagnosing ordinary psychological conditions to researching apparent alien abductees and their stories and experiences surrounding UFOs. Yep. Google it up, it's actually terrifying and very real. Apparently cases studied by Mac and abduction sometimes get involved with hypnosis. This guy was a tenured professor since the 50s at Harvard. He did his research. The UFO abduction rabbit hole led him to interviewing and studying more than 200 people who insist that they were taken. At first he was trying to crack the psychosis of the subject, but after studying and funding from the Rockefellers, private donors and universities, he wrote numerous books on the phenomena and its strangeness. Again, tenured and Pulitzer Prize winner. He sadly passed in 2004 from a drunk driver. His life and death holds heavy conspiracy debate around it. Check it out, it's uh, a little bit strange. Number nine, Sophia. We've seen her on Fallon, we've seen her on breakfast television. She still looks like a bad cyberpunk character, doesn't she? Sophia by Hanson Robotics, the most advanced human-like robot that we have. Well, actually, this is like their 12th one. This is the world's first robot citizen, literally. Not only is she considered a citizen, she has a credit card and a seat in the UN. Like what? In 2016, Sophia premiered on the Jimmy Fallon show playing rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, simple stuff. Two years later, she's harmonizing with Jimmy live. Also, they didn't sing Mr. Roboto. Like, I just feel like that was a huge missed opportunity there. Like, where are the writers, dude? I've seen the Terminator and Ex Machina, and at the Web Summit presentation in 2018, Sophia and her brother Han glitched out on stage and had a terrifying, cryptic, non-coherent conversation, joking about ending the world. Yeah, it's horrifying, you gotta check it out. Dude, I feel like Furbies were their first try, and now they got these like brat dolls mini Sophia's coming out soon. Like, where's this going? Number eight, Arthur Flowerdew. James Arthur Flowerdew was born in England in 1906. Grew up, paid his taxes, lived a pretty normal life. At about the age of 12, he began to have strange recurring dreams and hallucinations though. Over time, crystallizing into a very clear and vivid image. Dreams riddled with stone cities, carvings in cliffs, and vast deserts. He didn't understand what it all meant. One day, as an old man, he was watching a documentary on the BBC on the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. He was stunned. This was the city he had always seen. He called the BBC and asked them to interview him. Archaeological experts and the Jordanian government even invited him to come out to Jordan, where he continued to even baffle experts. Flowerdew was able to find his way around the city without a map, giving precise details on landmarks and even pointing out undiscovered locations. Yeah, here's the scary part. After all of this, he was convinced that he had lived an entire previous life in ancient times and was reincarnated in the 20th century. Number seven, Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly is a woman right out of a Jules Verne novel. In fact, you would think so if she hadn't met the man himself. In 1889, Nellie Bly took on a record-breaking voyage by traveling around the world in just 72 days. Her means of travel included a train, a steamship, a rickshaw, horse, and donkey. Her goal was to beat the fictional record set by Verne's hero Phileas Fogg in his 80-day odyssey. An event like this already appeared as a myth to the men of the time. Her editor at the New York World nearly refused to send her because her gender would make the trip impossible. No one but a man could do this, he told her. Very well, she replied. Start the man and I'll start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. He backed down and eventually Nellie was on her way, turning fiction into reality. Number six, the Black Museum. No, I'm not talking about the Black Museum episode of Black Mirror, but honestly, not too far off. People have done some pretty vicious things to their enemies. There's a long list, but imagine turning your enemies into a permanent dinner guest because that's exactly what Ferdinand I of Naples actually did. Though everyone thought he was going to be a great king, he actually ended up being pretty psychotic. He would invite his enemies over for dinner, and while they gorged on pheasant, he would take them out, either the old-fashioned way, or literally throw them out of a window. He would then retrieve and dress the bodies and stage them. He called it his black museum and would invite new acquaintances to view it so they would know exactly who they were dealing with, so not to mess with him. What a psycho! Number five, Sir Adrian Cotton de Watt. 
Love that name. There are gonna be a couple unbelievable events on this list from World War II, so just a heads up. But truth be told, the war itself is kind of hard to believe. Sir Adrian Carton de Wart was not only a man who survived the impossible once, but he made a career out of it. He wasn't like your black adder general in the back with a pipe. This dude was on the front lines tossing grenades with one arm because he already lost the other. He served in the Boer War, World War I, and World War II. He survived being shot in the face, skull, hip, leg, ankle, and ear. One eye and one arm short, this enthusiastic war hero dove into the bloodshed again and again. He was seen pulling pins out of grenades and throwing them with his one good arm during Battle of the Somme. But even as a 60 year old man, he was still a beast. His plane got shot down in April 1941, he crashed it into the Mediterranean, survived, swam all the way to shore, then he got captured by Italian soldiers, thrown into a POW camp, then he escaped, eluded capture for 8 days, but unfortunately the lack of Italian looks gave him away. He was released two years later and Churchill was such a big fan of him, he made him his rep over in China. He ended up passing away peacefully at age 83 despite hundreds of close calls with death. Number four, Simo Heha. This is actually kind of a plug for a short film I'm looking to raise funds for. Check out my Instagram to learn more. But his story is incredible and it's so unbelievable. Simo Heha's story sounds like something straight out of a movie, except it actually happened. A humble Finnish farmer who became the Soviet's nightmare in World War II. He is widely regarded as one of the most accomplished and skilled snipers in history. The Winter War began in Finland in 1939 after Russia decided that it was time to regain some territory. They thought it was going to be easy. But soon they came to fear the man who would be known as the White Death. He was trained as a sniper at a young age, didn't want to take human lives though, so he just became a farmer, but the lives of his countrymen were at stake. The Winter War lasted just over 100 days and within that time, Simo hit as many as 500 men, his personal best being 40 confirmed hits in one day. Some people estimate that it was over 800 people. In March 1940, he was hit in the jaw by a counter sniper, leaving him in a coma for 11 days. But when he awoke, however, the Russians surrendered. That is poetic justice. Number three, Alexander the Great. How did this guy exist? Was he the son of Zeus? The case is so convincing that even Alexander believed it himself. During the 15 years of his conquest, starting from his first victory when he was 18, Alexander never lost a battle. He was so prolific in battle that his strategies are still studied to this day. Before Alexander entered Egypt, they had been under Persian rule for just over 200 years. Through his incredible prowess and lightning quick decision making, Alexander defeated them. Egypt was so happy they even claimed him as their pharaoh. While he was in Egypt, however, Alexander decided to make the long trek to visit the shrine of Zeus Ammon. According to the man himself, he was guided there by ravens and it even rained during his journey which was interpreted as a blessing. When he got there, the priest named him a son of Zeus. Now if that doesn't make this guy sound like a myth, then I don't know what will. Number 2, Bodicea. Bodicea is the Morrigan in my mind. She is Xena, warrior princess. This woman was so ferocious, she was called the scourge of the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's right, this queen took on the Roman Empire. At the time Rome was invading the south of Britain, Queen Bodicea ruled the Inseni tribe of East Anglia along her husband, King Prasutagus. Though her early days remain mostly a mystery, she remains among the canon of heroes who defended the British Isles. She was fearsome to behold, with flaming red hair and a gaze so sharp it could cut glass. She and her husband fought against the Romans until his death, after which the Romans drove straight to take her on. They attacked her daughters publicly, which like mother bear, not a good idea, after which she toured in a chariot rallying the people in rebellion. She sat three Roman cities and took no prisoners. She annihilated the 9th legion when she took out their entire relief force. Sadly though, Bodicea fell after a vicious battle, but her name echoes in the halls of heroes. And last but not least, Richard, Saladin, and the Third Crusade. Just the Crusades in general are just unbelievable. Never in history have two rulers been so equally matched. Currently I'm reading Warriors of God, Richard the Lionheart, and Saladin and the Third Crusade by James Rustin. And the fact that everything I've read so far like, isn't just the next Game of Thrones novel astounds me. These two never met because Saladin believed that kings should not go to war if they had met, but because they were fighting over the Holy Land, war was kind of inevitable. But while Saladin did not engage in warfare, Richard dove right in the middle of everything. They both had such incredible admiration for each other that in the middle of battle, 
girls. They would send each other gifts. Like, I don't understand. You killed my men. You killed my men. Here's a fruit basket. Literally happened. And another example, during the Battle of Jaffa, Richard's horse ended up being killed and Saladin was so impressed with him that he sent him two new ones. Two! On top of that, Richard had taken off half of his armor before he had left ashore to fight. So he was like, basically like, half naked. Huh. Eventually Saladin tried to have him assassinated, but Richard was so ferocious in battle that everyone feared him. The dude was pretty much a human bulldozer. The two assassins ended up waking up the camp because they were fighting about who should take the guy out. Number 10, mummification. Back in the ancient Egyptian times, of course, mummification was common. And even today we're finding more mummies. It's pretty exciting. We're uncovering more ancient history every day. But how the hell was mummification done? Obviously we can't talk about this in school because we're a little too young and maybe it's a little frightening. So warning, it's a little gross. We've talked about teeth worms and trepidation, so I don't know, I feel like you're prepared. Well, for starters, mummification wasn't cheap. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. Now it's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you would put a hook in your nose and then you would pull out your, um, your brains. All of the brains and the mushy stuff just right out of your head. And then you'd cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all of those goods, all those organs, gone, easy. And then while those are drying, you would put the lungs and the liver in jars. So ancient Egyptians, that's why they needed a lot of jars. You gotta put lungs and organs in it. And then you put the heart back in the body and then wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that good stuff. And then you would cover the body in salt for 70 days. Now around day 40, you would stuff in some sand and then come day 70, that's when you would wrap them finally in the mummy bandages. And then the sarcophagus finally awaits. Those jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber. So if you watch the mummy and they're, you know, making somebody a mummy and they're like moving around, no, it wasn't like that at all. It took 70 days. It was a long, exhausting process. Number nine, first open heart surgery. Okay, going back to ancient Egyptians. Why not? We're on a little track here. So they would clean the entire body out and then they would put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this, obviously. But when was the first ever open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality after this? Well, the first successful open heart surgery after mummification went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. The surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man. This is how he did it. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add, there weren't many textbooks on this type of operations at the time. So the odds of survival here were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all being the first. At this point in time, there were no x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, and also, no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through nerves, muscles, ribs, you name it, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Now, Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted, obviously, to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I didn't remember hearing those details in school. Probably would have fainted at my desk. Number eight, Bridget Bishop. Okay, getting some witchy nonsense for this one. Back in 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America and in results you would get covered in these sores, these pimple-like bubbles. It was really uncomfortable. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the people of Salem at first thought, oh, they're probably cursed. They're probably witches. Hence why they're acting odd. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of the disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, talking nonsense. Obviously they were extremely ill. And so the village doctor, William Greggs, just said, eh, I think they're bewitched. I think there's a couple of witches in our presence. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, you know, science, that's how it works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch and she was just cursing everybody around her. It was kind of the reason they kicked off the entire Salem witch hunt. It was all because of Bridget Bishop. Over the next few months, around 150 more folks were all convicted, all meeting their similar fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop or maybe it was just rye disease. It's now referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions. It feels like bugs are under your skin, it's horrible. But these doctors didn't know that back then. Everybody just thought they were all cursed, that they were witches. No, they were not cursed, they just needed help. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly stopped. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter, I vote the latter, me personally. Number seven, Proctor's Ledge. Over 1,000 documents from Salem's witch trials, yet none of the accounts actually specify where the hangings took place. 
For more than 300 years, it was believed that the 19 people who were accused, tried, and executed in the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 were hanged at the summit of Gallows Hill. Maps of 1700 Salem show Gallows Hill marked out, but no actual marker of the execution site. Hmm, that's odd. A team of researchers began to reconsider the evidence in 2010 and eventually concluded it was the right spot. Yeah, oopsies. Actually, the real execution spot was called Proctor's Ledge. Also, eerie name for where they hang people, isn't it? It was confirmed in 2016 by scientists after ground penetrating data and writings from 1692 that it wasn't the actual location of the brutality. I know what you're thinking. It's named after John Proctor. No, no it's not. However, really odd timing as he was one of the witches accused of witchcraft. Locals say that the ghost named the Lady in White visits Proctor's Ledge often, which now makes sense with the whole we found the right spot stuff. Visitors claim to have caught sightings of her and even catch her disembodied voice. Yeah. Number six, props. Elmer McCurdy was an American outlaw, running with a small crew, banking and train robbing the Wild West until he was killed in a shootout with sheriffs after robbing a Katy train in Oklahoma in 1911. Famously known as the bandit who wouldn't give up, his mummified body was first put on display at an Oklahoma funeral home before being an amusement, traveling carnival show to carnival show during the 1920s right through the 1960s. After changing ownership several times, McCurdy's remains eventually wound up at the Pike Amusement Zone in Long Beach, California. His corpse was then used as a prop, but then discovered by a film crew on a set of The Six Million Dollar Man. They were positively identified in 1976, and the following year, 1977, Elmer McCurdy's body was finally laid to rest at the Summit View Cemetery in Oklahoma. McCurdy's fingers were apparently so damaged that detectives couldn't even pull a fingerprint. The coroners had to x-ray his teeth and measure his bones to ID him. His pockets included a bullet, a sunny amusement museum of crime ticket, a newspaper article, and a 1924 penny. Yeah, that's terrible. Just weekend at burning him for like 60 years set to set? Not really knowing it's a real body? People will do anything for money, won't they? Number five, Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump, officially named the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program, launched in 1946 to 1947. An operation to establish an Antarctic research base organized by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. High Jump included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts. The war's end signaled the onset of the atomic age and a desire to secure supplies of uranium. With its almost unlimited mineral deposits, the largely unexplored territory of Antarctica was just the prize. It commenced 1946 and ended in late 1947. Or did it? Also known as Task Force 68, Bird and his team established the Little America 4 base near three previous bases in the ice. The frozen aircrafts would photograph as much of the Antarctic's land surface as possible during this three month operation. Seems like the public thinks that high jump could have been more fishy than we think. Seems like skeptics are leaning towards more of a secret military expedition to the center of the earth type stuff. Yep, apparently there's a mouth to the center of the planet in the Antarctic and there was a secret race to find it. High Jump is still today at the mercy of the internet on whether or not it was a legit project or a secretly funded scientific expedition. Google it up. It's pretty wild and very real. Number four, Ouija boards. Popularized by teens in the 1970s, the Ouija board has earned its reputation over the years. Created almost 100 years before its heightened popularity, the year is 1891. And as the first ads started to appear in papers claiming, quote, Ouija, the wonderful talking board. The title from a Pittsburgh toy and novelty shop. The first paper described it as a magical game that answered questions about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. A flat board with the letters of the alphabet configured in two semicircles. Above, the numbers zero through nine. The words yes and no in the upper corners, goodbye at the bottom. No batteries included nor needed. Now. The origins are pretty messy, and it's hard to kind of pinpoint who or what inspired these early attempts at this game. It kind of just appeared on shelves. No, literally. The Kennard Novelty Company exclusively made and marketed these talking boards, and apparently the lore goes that one of the designer's sisters was a medium and asked the board what it would like to be called. It responded, Ouija, followed by, good luck. Well, that's absolutely terrifying. At least good sportsmanship though, right? Yeah, I've never played with one of these, nor will I ever. That's a no-brainer for me, 100%. Number three, the Philadelphia Experiment. I pray that this one is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around the time 
that don't really seem to add up. The Philadelphia Experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the US Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer the USS Eldridge and the bizarre scientific results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer successfully made itself invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in Philly. Sounds pretty cool, right? So what's the catch? The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects, including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. Like people stuck in the walls and stuff. Stuck in the floors like this is a scene from Jumanji. Terrifying. The story surfaced in the late 1950s when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a US Navy research organization. The US Navy maintains that there has been no such experiment ever conducted and that the details are highly exaggerated and falsified. Dude, I hope so, because this is horrifying. Number two, wow. In a 1959 paper, Cornell University physicists speculated that if an extraterrestrial civilization was attempting to communicate with us using radio signals, that they might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. In 1973, Ohio State University assigned the big ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 1977, Jerry Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing data and spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues astonished. The wow signal was the first signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Amon discovered the anomaly, impressed by the result. On the computer printout, he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. Wow. Leading to the event's famous name. The signal lasted for a full 72 seconds, and it remains today as the strongest candidate for an ET radio transmission ever detected. And number one, of course, the USS Cyclops. Launched in May of 1910, the USS Cyclops was a Protoss-class collier built for the United States Navy, a huge cargo ship designed for transporting coal. In 1918, the cursed vessel left Rio de Janeiro, heading for Barbados right around a certain dangerous triangle. Unfortunately, the Voyager was never to be seen again. Named Cyclops after a race of giants from Greek mythology, she was huge and heavy, unmissable by the naked eye. So what happened to her? The loss of the ship and crew still remains the single largest loss of life at sea the United States Navy has ever experienced. Funny thing is, it went right through the Bermuda Triangle, a place where Magnetic compasses stop working, ships are never heard from again, and of course the military still refuses to operate and research. Skeptics are quick to say aliens and black holes, but the magnetism surrounding the Bermuda Triangle cases might be a logical explanation. I think they still owe us some explanations, no? I'm looking at you, Freedom of Information Act. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as de Verdun was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Franked Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most, come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? I didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. 
Shawshank Redemption 2, Medieval Edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's Civil War. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Be like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight, stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Yeah, the backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. Yeah. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I got to drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I, that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, pole vaulting. This is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane. Just. Guy with a stick over a building? Are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. Back in the dark ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and bleh, voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly, yeah. The poor guy bridged to Terabithia at himself, so I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the Iron Throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. That's where we go, who to crack in the mic. The Iron Chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say it, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used, you know? Like I mentioned the ducking stool in part one. That was, that was bad. This one's more Viking. This one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs. So you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. Oh my gosh. Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple-like bubbles. It was horrible, it was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word, and they're like, Great, that did nothing. He's like, 
okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everyone thought they were all just cursed, which is, they were not cursed. They just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. It's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal, please. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go on the way out. That's really it. The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pull vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches, people who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty like street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now of course people were left there to die a lot but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair, people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah, it gets worse, believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open, hot areas, a lot of the time, more often than not, they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial, actual court. Grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep. I wonder what house this pig would belong to. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night, not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess. 
so that they can take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with, more weight. Yeah, keep him coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away, still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. Yep, that's history. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure, then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside. That's it. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe. I don't know. It's kind of Horrible. In the Middle Ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now, historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here, and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped, and it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now, the death toll here, I mean, obviously, it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames? Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surname names were a little bit different. They were descriptions almost about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it. Greg's, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out. He would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this. Here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards. You know what I mean? It's like a ritual. You gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now, apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then, there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty, pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. 
But how many of those were actual witches? Like, really, was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know. Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good, the middle age greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 1560. Which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. Number five, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, plague bearer. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the dark ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? We can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bearer is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? If there's anything we learned in the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation, ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages, yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go. Keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale. There you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back, so. <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you would leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this was a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare they, how dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes, and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest 
At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilian Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing, as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals, they wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French Covent, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually, something was afoot. That was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Number 10, the papal schism or schism. Who knows? Suffice it to say that the Pope is a pretty big deal in the Catholic realm of religion. Pretty much the CEO of loving Jesus the most. But it is also a position of immense power, which means there is a lot of competition for the next one in line. Usually there is one reigning Pope at a time, but at one point there were three because there was so much rivalry. Between 1378 to 1417, there wasn't just one, not two, but three rival popes, each with their own following of Sacred College of Cardinals. After 70 years of Pope Clement V living in Avignon, France, the Roman populace wanted a pope that was like at least Italian. Can we just get an Italian? When Pope Urban VI was elected, he proved so hostile that a bunch of cardinals went back to France and elected their own pope because the other one didn't count. They didn't like him. He thought he was voted in because people were afraid. They probably were. They elected Clement VII, who lived in France, so now there were two popes. Two popes, as you can guess, had a disastrous effect on the church, so people were like, okay, children, if you can't play nice, either both of you resign, or we will pick one for you. The popes refused to concede because they were like, no, I don't want to be pope. So cardinals arranged the Council of Pisa and elected a third pope, because that will solve everything, Alexander V, who succeeded John the Twenty-Third. John formed the Council of Constance, then was kicked out of papacy by said council, then the Roman Pope who is now Gregory XII resigned the Avignon Pope who was dismissed. Eventually the whole schism ended when Martin V was elected in 1417. It's just so confusing, I feel like I want to vomit. Too much. Too much Popes. On number nine, Bone Wars. The early days of paleontology were intense and pretty cutthroat. Since this was a relatively new science with a plethora of things to discover, so many researchers set out to learn and find as much as they could, and this created a lot of rivalries since everyone wanted to gain notoriety for their findings. The competition was intense, but nothing could ever measure up to the rivalry between Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope. These two rival paleontologists did everything in their power to throw each other off or to disprove them, and the lengths that they went to to accomplish this was almost unbelievable. Both of them took off to Montana and Utah to dig up as many fossils before the other guy did, but they just didn't stop at digging. They each hired spies and saboteurs to get in the way of others' work, and they even tried to pass off fake skeletons as well. This is where we got the Brontosaurus controversy. One of the scientists had discovered the dinosaur known as Apatosaurus, and so the other one had to one-up him and introduce Introduced his own species named the Brontosaurus. The only problem with it though was the fact that it was a skeleton of the same dinosaur but with an intentionally placed skull from another dinosaur. It was a fake. This back and forth was intense in the scientific community and made for some pretty unbelievable stories. Number 8, The Man in the Iron Mask. It is kind of crazy that the story actually exists and it could be nothing. It could have been some dude who had syphilis who didn't want anyone to see his you know. But the world remains convinced that he was more than he seemed. The movie, The Man in the Iron Mask with Leonardo DiCaprio, John Malkovich, you know, has one theory that the man was actually the twin brother of the king. But the true identity of the man in the Iron Mask remains a 350 year old mystery. But it happened! In 1669, a man was arrested and put in prison for 30 years and was held in the infamous Bastille prison in France until he died in 1703. He was never seen without a black velvet mask or an iron mask. It's 
also described. No one knew who he was or for what possible reason he was put in there. The likes of Voltaire and Alexander Dumas tried to speculate who he was, and more recently, Paul Soninio, a professor at the University of California, believed he was Eustache Doge based on prison accounts and the guard. Doge was in the prison at the same time as the masked man and was once transported in a chair covered so people wouldn't see him. But still, nothing has been confirmed, and I just think it's really cool and I like the speculation. Number seven, we might we might live forever? I don't know. Put down the Botox and hold the collagen injections. There might be another way. Thanks to the SENS Research Foundation, we may find a way to turn back the clock when it comes to aging. Dr. Aubrey de Grey is an English author, biomedical gerontologist, and mathematician who believes that one day, one day, Aging might be stopped by medical intervention. His research involves attempting to find a way to treat the disease of aging by repairing damage on a molecular level. One of the main causes of aging are dead cells or senescent cells. Once the cell stops multiplying, they release a whole stew of chemicals that cause inflammation and the breakdown of surrounding tissue. Now, usually, our body fights these off because they are recognized as imposters and they are forced to self destruct, but they accumulate with age. If they are successful at finding a way to diminish these cells, it could mean that they could make a 60 year old feel and look 30 again. Pretty exciting stuff. Not without controversy though. MIT Tech Review challenged molecular biologists to disprove Gray's claims for a chance to win 20 grand, but nobody has yet. So. Number six, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft. Humanity is pretty freaking astounding, and our reach is stretching further and further out into the universe every day. Right now, the Voyager 1 and 2 are currently exploring interstellar space, but NASA just launched yet another incredibly exciting space adventure. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft is currently out in space at a distance of 50 times the distance between Earth and the Sun. Scientists estimate that by the 2040s, it will finally surpass Voyager 1 and 2 in interstellar space and who knows what it will find. New Horizon gets its power source from a single radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is super cool how it works. Essentially a kind of nuclear battery that sources its power through the natural radioactive decay of plutonium dioxide fuel. What? I'm not a scientist, so that blew my mind. I'm not quite sure if I understand it. Do we understand it? Let us know in the comments. The decay rate is high enough to create a reliable amount of heat so the engine can just keep going and going and going. So it just opens up a future of discoveries, and I'm excited. I'm excited. Number five, nano robots. Does anyone remember the first Agent Cody Banks movie where the villain like installs these evil nano robots and ice cubes, but they're not evil, he just uses them for evil. Initially the tech was used for good, right? To help clean up oil spills for instance, but that's that's where my mind went when I learned this. According to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, they have created cell sized robots that can navigate and detect issues in their environment. Now imagine that the environment is actually your lungs or your liver or your veins or your eyes. This gives scientists hope that a future where disease detection doesn't take months of waiting in line, just mere minutes. The aim of these nanobots is to help detect infection or disease within the body before it even shows. I'm not sure how I feel about tiny little robots floating inside me, but um, if I if I would be cool, I think I'd have to ask myself this question. If I'd be okay with Miss Frizzle shrinking a bus down and going through my nose, would I be okay with that? Then I might be okay with this. Uh, number four, we might meet aliens. So I know they said that the random monoliths that appeared around the world were made by artists. Convenient. Artists are essentially aliens. We're weird. We are so weird. It was 2020. We couldn't handle anything else. But in truth, meeting aliens may not be something that just happens in Doctor Who. In fact, Jamie Matthews, astrophysicist and professor at the University of British Columbia, said, and I quote, by the year 2118, extraterrestrial life won't be news but historical fact. I recognize that some of us might not live past 100, myself included, but that statement still implies that it could happen within that time frame. The most terrifying thought about that will be how we react to them, though by alien life it doesn't necessarily mean humanoid alien creatures with oval heads. It will most likely mean that we will find a specific kind of anaerobic bacteria, like kind of what we might 
find in Venus with the phosphine and everything, if you know what I'm talking about. But according to the Pentagon report, if I'm being honest here, I'm not so worried about the aliens. I'm more worried about how we're going to react to them. Will it make us more humble, fearful, arrogant? Will this be the war of the world scenario? God, I hope not. I hope we all get along and we're just a big happy space family. Unlikely. Before we land on our top three, if you're still with us, give us a like and comment on what you're looking forward to the most. Also, if you're new to the hive, give us a subscribe. We'll love you forever. Number three, a visit to Mars. So in the next few years, we are putting boots on the moon. 2024 is gonna be a big year. It has been over 50 years since astronauts last set foot on the moon and the Artemis program is set to accomplish this. But what's more exciting is what's coming next. This trip is also a kind of test drive for life support systems that will hopefully extend the trip to months, even a year. If that goes well, then the next step is Mars. NASA's InSight mission is now on Mars and its stay has been extended in order to measure how life on Mars, such as quakes and dust devils, will affect human visitors. It's also a test for how useful solar panels will be on Mars and if it's an effective form of energy. But its journey to and from the planet is the precursor to manned missions to Mars. So depending on how the next year goes, we might be around to see some astronauts on Mars. If they don't bring Mars bars, I'm going to be really upset. That's all I'm saying. Number two, space elevators. Sounds so cool. Satellites, rocket ships, and now space elevators. Oh baby. Tokyo based Obayashi Corp has boasted that they have plans to build one by 2050. China is in the race, ambitiously trying to beat them by five years. The idea of having a space elevator is considered the holy grail of space exploration, even though it sounds like a concept straight out of Willy Wonka. It will essentially be a long cable extending from the planet's surface with electromagnetic vehicles traveling along the cable. To keep it from like crashing like a beanstalk back to Earth, it will be attached to a massive counterbalance on one end, like an asteroid. In fact, exactly like an asteroid. That's that's a straight up quote from NASA. They want to move an asteroid into place for this purpose. I don't know, I don't know, I feel like that's really ambitious. For some reason, I think NASA's plan may take a little longer, but it is in the works, folks. A mini elevator called StarsMe, devised by Japanese physicists, will simulate on a small scale what conditions on an elevator to the stars would encounter in a weightless environment, so. Who knows, who knows? Let's go. Number one. AI surpasses human intelligence. Ah, uh, AI, artificial intelligence. Should we be scared? I don't know. Would Mary Shelley be shaking her book at us if she saw how far we've come and are going? From apps that anticipate our needs to robots doing TED Talks, AI is here and it ain't going anywhere. In May and June of 2016, Yale University and Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute took a poll of hundreds of industry leaders in order to answer just one question, will AI surpass human intelligence? And if so, when? Their findings? Well, it looks like the census is that AI will be as capable, if not more, than humans in most tasks by 2060. Add another 76 years and experts think that AI will take over all human jobs. That sucks. My first job was at Wendy's. Imagine a robot serving me. They pretty much already do. The results are based on 352 experts who responded, though I'm pretty sure there is some flux in that. We've been wrong about a lot of things before. Maybe we are about this one. Who knows? Number 10, Abe the Wrestler. At 20 years old with a record of 300 fights and one loss, he stands 6'4 inches at 185 pounds. Your future president of the United States, honest Abe, the chair, give him the chair. That's right, Abe Lincoln was quite the ruffian. However, the wrestling back then wasn't as organized as there was no WWF per se. It was mostly just a show of strength and skill, but they were competitions among men. Huge crowds gathered, towns watched, everybody gambled, it was great. A little wrestling. His fights earned him respect while campaigning too. He would even scrap hecklers at debates. Yeah, just walks down midpoint and Wheeler whips someone under their neck. His chirps were amazing too. He would just look at people like Gladiator and call them out. He'd be like, hey, I'm the big buck of this lick. If any of you want to try it, come on and get your wet horns. Yeah, I didn't think so. Sorry, Mr. Douglas, proceed. Thank you. Number nine, Roy Sullivan. They say lightning never strikes the same place twice, but if you knew Roy Sullivan, you knew that's not entirely true. Yeah, meet the man who was struck by lightning 
seven times and lived to tell the tale. Roy Sullivan was born in 1912. He sadly passed away in 1983 when he was 71 years old, but God tried, God tried a few times to get him out earlier it seems. He was born in Greene County, Virginia. Roy was a park ranger in Shenandoah National Park in 1936. He was nicknamed the Human Lightning Conductor and he appeared in the Guinness Book of World Records. Roy's first encounter with, you know, the might of Thor was when he was just 30 years old at the Fire Lookout Tower. He said that lightning strike again out of the seven he survived was the most painful out of all of them. The lightning bolts burned a strip all the way down his leg, even blowing a hole through his shoe. Yet somehow he survived. Roy was also hit by lightning in 1969 while driving a truck, and also in 1970 while gardening on an otherwise clear day like today. Also in 1972 while inside a guardhouse. Also in 1976 during another storm. And finally in 1977 while fishing. Yeah, Roy passed away in 1983 and to this day, two of his ranger hats are on display at the Guinness World Exhibits in New York City and South Carolina. This man cheated death eight times, seven. Number eight, Miss Unsinkable. Violet Constant Jessup, AKA the queen of sinking ships, or Miss Unsinkable, was an Argentine Irish woman who worked as an ocean liner stewardess, memoirist, and Red Cross nurse in the early 20th century. Jessup is well known for having survived three sinkings of major ships the RMS Olympic in 1911, the RMS Titanic in 1912, and her sister, the HMHS Britannic in 1916. Yeah, talk about the luckiest person ever. Lady's got some angels watching over her, I swear. The first ship, they turned around and made it back just in time. The Titanic, well, watch the movie, you'll understand. And then the third ship, it must have just felt personal by that point. Really? Not to mention barely surviving tuberculosis as a child. This woman is truly a saint. Returning to work after all those accidents, dedicating her entire life to the Red Cross, trying to save others, Sadly, she passed away at 83. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, uh, yes, I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice, here you go, for you and yours. Enjoy, Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no, but they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table, you're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation. So they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified. And once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise. Hard to get out of your mind. Radio carbon 
serpent tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I look at our producer Chris, I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly. It was far too cold for them to even stand a chance. And it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were, Horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, plague bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johann, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray ball. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot. Yeah.